Welcome back to my channel. I am here with James Batsford of the UK-based label New Land that just released this excellent box set on Dorothy Ashby. Dorothy Ashby with strings attached. New Land began in nineteen in nineteen forty six. Twenty one. James, tell us about some of your earlier releases. Oh, that Ming is behind you. Is that? Tell me about that. So that's an, one of our releases um, that came out last year, and that's an expanded edition of a modern jazz symposium originally released on Bethlehem. And this includes some bonus tracks um, and a single version um, of one of the tracks um, that was previously only on a 45. Um, so this is our most recent kind of standard LP release. Before that, we started with Jerry Mulligan, Nightlights. That came out in 2021, followed it with Blue Mitchell, self-titled album um and howard mcgee dusty blue wow that's one of my favorite mingus albums that has the uh the one about the guy who listens to jazz downtown and has to go up exactly yeah yeah uh, what an amazing track so yeah who, tell me a little about that did you i'm sure you did it from the tapes who did the remastering and the cutting of lacquers for that so that was done by kevin gray cut them remastered cut the lacquers um we we would dealt with bmg who who own the Bethlehem catalog now. And so we deal with them in the UK and licensed all the stuff from them and also did it in collaboration with the Mingus estate who we know quite well and are very supportive. So it was all kind of done above board. And, you know, something we always try and do is bring in the artist management, whoever the estate to kind of make sure everyone's on board with our ideas. Um, So is that your most recent work the mingus that, so the mingus is the most recent of the kind of standard releases but in terms of the box sets the dorothy ashby would be the most recent release um, now, and all, that, are all of your releases like this is limited to five thousand? i think are they all that's, limited? no that's limited to one thousand good lord yeah <laughs> um are your standard releases limited editions as well they differ Howard McGee and Blue Mitchell, we did a thousand of each of those. And I think we probably will leave it at that. Um, we tend not to put a number on the kind of standard LP releases because demand and, you know, a, a good example of it is Jerry Mulligan. We were a bit unsure of the popularity of that record and it kind of surpassed all of, all of our expectations. And really, you know, I think people are kind of re- defining it as a classic now so it's kind of picked up a lot of steam um so that's kind of kept selling um but you know we tend not to we don't want to just keep keep it going and just over pressing um so where can someone watching this find the mingus much less the dorothy ashby so dorothy where ashby we are down to a few copies now at the time of recording um mingus would be available via our store newland um our new land okra store which um you can find on our instagram or facebook page what does the uh mingus go for what's the u.s price it would be 35 dollars, i believe and what yeah. is that artwork behind you uh behind your head that is really oh, so cool. this is just a pollock reprint yeah wow. it's nice <laughs> oh, not an original oh well <laughs> well let's talk about this uh amazing dorothy ashby set that has um it's her first five records, I'm, I believe. Six. And these are, not only are the pressings beautiful, these are some of the finest uh, sleeves I've ever seen. Uh, I, my little camera won't do them justice, but they're really beautiful. They're kind of a, they're matte finish, but what are they called? Reverse sleeve? So it's called reverse board sleeve. And the idea is to kind of give it a rougher finish just to kind of harden it and kind of, um, I, I really like the, the way it presents the art, this, this way of doing it. And it's what we tend to do for all of our releases. It's kind of like our signature look for, for all our records. It also sort of sets them apart from the, uh, the lamination fever, which is yes. really cool, but this is something different. And also you kind of feel the need to have clean hands. When you're, yes. <laughs> when, when you're touching these because there's uh they probably attract dirt and which is like that's an iconic cover yeah and it also comes with a uh with a really uh i mean one of the best and i'm not just saying that because i'm on the line with james one of the best booklets i've ever seen uh because of the liner notes by 
What's her name? She's done an effing job. Right. Did an Amazing incredible job. Numbers. And the and the photos they have, like there's a photo of Roy Haynes I've never seen anywhere else. Amazing photos. Now we often see the tape boxes, but we don't see um we never see uh, the the clippings. This thing is full of uh, advertisements for her gigs. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to see this for a John Coltrane set or Elvin Jones. I mean, you never see this. Um, and I'll ask you about those in a minute, but it's a great booklet. Uh, I listen to all these records. They sound great. You really hear the evolution of her playing. What um What inspired this project for you? For me, I kind of picked up on her through her work on, you know, on on labels like Regent Prestige, New Jazz, labels I follow and try and always pick up when I'm in record stores. And I just kind of picked up her records over the years and they really just grew really fond of them. Um, and I kind of, they weren't being reprinted. I think In a Minor Groove was done, but none of the other records were, were made available. For, well, I don't think they have been since the time. And it just felt like, you know, these records should be in print. They should be heard by more people. I feel, feel like she wasn't really kind of, she's never discussed in kind of the larger discussion, the larger kind of thoughts of jazz. So I think it's kind of right that she had a bit of a moment and it's kind of, I, I, I personally just thought as a collector of her records that surely other people will kind of dig into her and there might be a lot of people that aren't aware of her work that can kind of check her out. I think, you know, perhaps her, her later stuff is a lot more known but this early period is kind of, I guess, probably because the records are so hard to find, um, is a lot less known. So I think it's kind of, and they're, they're great albums. So, you know. You mentioned uh, Regent. Talk about a rare, weird label. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I worked at the Jazz Record Center one day a week. Um, and we have this weird Regent album with an organ on the cover. And it's some off the wall record with Charles Mingus on bass. All right. So it just sits there in the Charles Mingus section and people go, what the heck is this? Yeah. Oh, well, what else was on Regent, if you recall? That's a really. God, I couldn't off the top of my head give you names. Um, I just it's kind of I guess for me personally, I mean, the, the labels I always go to, obviously, Blue Note, Prestige. But then, yeah, New Jazz, I think, is a great label. Um, Those kind of the second level ones, place like Bethlehem, it's kind of like, you know, people often focus on yeah, the Prestige and the Blue Notes, but those the second level down kind of labels the slightly smaller ones were just re releasing a lot of the records by the artists on those bigger labels but just killer records that really go under the radar you know um so there's a lot of kind of cool things to be found there yeah what do you think uh, accounts for this uh i mean these are 60 year old records i mean these yeah. this is ancient music and i was i was thinking about it you know and i think uh you know it's impossible for most American jazz artists in the U.S. because they have to compete with the past. Overall, do you think, what is this draw and fascination with music from the middle of the last century? I, 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 I don't know. I guess for me, as someone who wasn't around there, it's the historical context of the time. It's interesting what was going on politically. It was interesting, especially from someone from the U.K. looking at America, what was happening in America that was such a significant time of change. And then you've got this whole, like, you know, the whole black experience in America during that time, the records that were being made, not just in jazz. I mean, it, this goes through all, all kinds of music, but jazz specifically just has this like real magic to it of what was being done. You know, these guys, were, you know, and, and women were playing clubs, these really small clubs everywhere in America, releasing these records a lot of the time to not much popularity. But just that's what they did. And they released so many records continuously, weren't disheartened by the fact that a lot of the time it might not be as popular as it should be. Certainly someone like Dorothy Ashby is a good example of that, you know, but just persevered a lot of the time against the odds as well. You really spell that out, or Shannon spells it out in the liner notes, her whole career where she studied at the same school where Alice Coltrane studied. Yeah. And she made the records. Then she kind of went back to Detroit and sort of started an institute or something, her own club. What did she start? Well, she basically in Detroit, she had a theater club for, for stars. Her and her her husband wrote screen, wrote plays, performed them, um, well, had act actors perform them, made the music for it. I mean, they were a real kind of a renaissance couple. The stuff they were doing um beyond the music, 
So it was the records. It was this. She also had a radio show where she would review the arts of the time, the culture, the culture of the time, going through jazz records, going through movies sometimes. Um, I mean, she was a, a real intellectual and she would use many platforms to display this. She also would review for local Detroit press. She would review different you know, records and talk about things. And something that kind of a lot of people don't know that's mentioned, I think, in the notes is that she would, when she was doing this radio show, she would perform folk standards from like the, you know, um, from 16 or 1700s. She would perform these, these, this music um, in a folk style. She'd sing with her harp. I mean, it's incredible stuff. I've kind of, the estate has this stuff and I've listened to it to bits and pieces and it's amazing what she was doing. Highly intelligent, talented woman beyond just these records that we're aware of. And um, you told me earlier that I think you said that uh, you were able to hear some of her radio broadcasts. Or yeah. Records. Yeah. So there's there's these amazing tapes. And um, yeah, they're kind of I guess there's no it's hard to figure out a domain in, in which to release them. But it's just fascinating to hear her talking. You know, she's got a great perspective and a great view on things. And the way she talks about jazz records of the time is is fantastic. And Somebody, like I said, these I mean, amazing you've records. Such an amazing excavation mining thing here. I mean, like, like the uh, they usually. It's funny. Back in the day, when I first came to New York City in 1990, I was the Jazz by a Tower Record Center, and the only people who did any sort of reissues worth a crap were the Japanese. We get these Japanese CD sets. They were like, yeah. oh my god, they were beautiful. And now the the U.S. game is up, but maybe they're taking it for granted because this recent. Uh, Coltrane Dolphy at the Village Gate. I mean, it's just the cover art sucks. It's like a little three page thing. It's so flimsy. I mean, even though it's a great record. So it's amazing to see something like this where you've gone, you went down a rabbit hole to find these things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes. this this thing is hard to find. I'm sure it's expensive, but man, it's uh just the amount of information in here and the re all the records are in great shape. Um, it's really something. I was really struck by going through these, how fully realized she was as a soloist from the very first record. She's yeah, really something. And by the last record, I've I've heard I've heard the Ruby Eye record where she sings. Is she singing on any of these records? No, I don't believe she does. Um, but I de I definitely think by the last record you can kind of hear traces of where she's headed. It, you can hear the kind of her sound develop over these six records, which also why I think it's quite an interesting selection of albums because it does show her quite straight ahead, you know, coming out of that real, I mean, as a harpist, the training involved and practice, I think you, you have, you know, it's just such a difficult instrument to conquer. And she kind of, yeah, hits the ground running with the first record, but then just kind of starts experimenting and going through and obviously takes on the sounds of the time as the music was developing in jazz and, and sees where she goes. But yeah, I think it's an amazing kind of journey on these six records to where we know she ends up after. Yeah, it's for sure. I mean, she is so, uh, I mean, her solos are perfect out of the gate and they're well recorded. And I hadn't really thought about that. Nobody had really ever done that before. We don't, Alice Coltrane started out playing piano on records, not harp, but right. she's out of the gate, um, killing. Tell me, how did you get, I meant to ask you, all these amazing clippings and photings? I mean, they're really, it's really something. This is just a ton of research. I mean, we we had this guy, Lewis Witt, who's kind of a descendant of the Ashby family. Um, he was incredibly helpful in sharing what he, because he, he he's done a lot of research over the years. She was very generous with sharing that. We dug into Detroit Free Press, went through, I spent hours going through you know, every week's newspapers for years in Detroit. Stuff online? You can dig some of it online. You have to also get in touch with the right people and in, in the right papers and stuff. But yeah, it's out there. Um, I'm just I'm just pulling it and just looking for any mention of Dorothy. And there was quite a lot. She was very prominent in, in Detroit at that time. And Shannon, obviously, her research was just incredible. And the work she did kind of really uh, insane. So, yeah that all combined really put it all together everything clicked what was it the equivalent of like going through a microfish i think they call it and using <laughs> the switch and everything zipping by it was a yeah like that? yeah 
basically just like Dorothy, Dorothy looking for it. Yeah, wherever you can find mention of Dorothy. Can you give me to the degree? Well, I want to ask you if you could give me a thumbnail of each record. But what were the what were the challenges of putting all this together, and how long did it take? to do all this all in all probably just over three years from like the initial idea and concept through to release um the, probably the biggest uh, general issue or not issue but kind of hurdle to overcome was just this was born out of just my loving of her as, at the beginning and you know then finding the right people who shared that love people like shannon um and then you you know you spend years putting this together trying to track down tapes, license from the right people, find out who, who have the rights, making sure the estate are aware. That in itself takes a long time. And then it's you spend all this time putting it together, putting it together. A lot of costs go into something like this. It's not, you know, it's not a financially cheap thing to do. And you at the end of the day, you you're you're viewing it like how many other Dorothy Ashby fans are out there that are, you know, are willing to buy into a project of this scale, it's kind of, it, it's it's not just, oh, we're selling a Dorothy, Dorothy Ashby record. It's like, no, it's going to be a six LP record. Oh, it's, you know, it's got this price point. It's like, it, so you, it, when we announced it and the kind of reaction we got was really justified it all. It was, it was fantastic. And to see kind of people really dig her, that's an amazing thing. So it was all, it was all worth it. But that whole three years, you're thinking, oh, are, are there other people out there that, care as much you like know writing a book yeah hoping someone you know gets on board also included this amazing if you look at the i mean look how not some boxes are just done with the record shoved in the box but this has like a subfolder that has these cool little harps which kind of reminds me of the blue note sleeves from the uh, 70s that had all the little blue notes um but James has agreed to, to give us little thumbnail sketches of each record. And this is the first one. Just however much you feel like saying about each one, and we'll move on to the next one, sir. So I think this first record kind of is in line with a lot of the kind of jazz records being made at the time. It's kind of, you know, I think the band are fantastic. It's the first of her collaborations with Frank Wes, um, who we know met her when he was touring Detroit and was kind of hooked up with her. Um, which started a few album collaboration. Um, album on Regent, you know, her only... I mean, it, the strange thing about the, all these records is it was it's literally one album for each label. She didn't really have a run on anyone specific. So she kind this of was one always... was on Regent? This one was the Regent record, yeah. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, kind of... It's a bit of a half and half record. We have the kind of jazz standard covers to start it off. And then the second half is kind of more her own originals. So it's an interesting record kind of, I guess, like a starting point to her testing her own material. And what's cool about these also, these are small labels. If you look at some of the larger labels from the period, even with the major artists, some of the covers are so corny and cliched. Yeah. Never mind the overabundance of white people in the couple of yeah. black people's records. But some of them are just so corny. I mean, that's a beautiful, yeah. beautifully conceived cover. Well, it's um, an interesting thing, actually, with kind of a few of these records is the fact that it, it's, it's unusual because she and I'm guess I would think she must have pushed for this, that she appears on the cover because you've got to think how many male artists of this time who who weren't put on the cover or swapped out for like white, white people, basically. I mean, it's amazing. She got her face on there. She got, you know, it's her on these records. It's her. It's You really feel it's her album. That's a really good point. Can you say a little bit about this one? And, and you're right. The. the uh... There she is. She's a very attractive woman and she had a beautiful voice. Yeah, I and I think again, a record with Frank Wears. This time, I mean, I think the um the bands are incredible. And I, I didn't mention this before, but the second of her collaborations with Rudy Van Gelder as well. Um, this one's got Herman Reinhardt Taylor on as well. I mean, it's just great musicians throughout. This one's on prestige, recorded a year later. I mean, just the, the, the kind of she's really, I think this is the record she really kind of starts to to really get into it and really kind of you start hearing Dorothy Ashby. And then this slightly weird murky cover. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Completely out of line with the others. Um, but pretty cool as well. I love the green of it. Um, this one was on new jazz again, Van Gelder again, oh, Frank Wes. Yeah. And this is the Roy Haynes record that you mentioned before. Um, 
yeah, I mean, just throughout throughout these records, it's just the level of musicianship. It's just the best players around on on yeah. there. Um, it's fantastic. And these are these sleeves are really well done. You know, I've uh, gotten a few of the uh, third man by request, and the records are great, but the sleeves are just shit. They're like really yeah. thin. I mean, you can tear the sleeve when you're opening the record. So these sleeves are heavy duty. Another unusual, uh, surreal sort of cover. Yeah, very strange on Jazzland. Really, just bizarre. Uh, again, just like almost psychedelic before the before the psychedelic sixties kicked in. Very strange, but it very cool. Like, it looks like a uh, a female playing the vibes. And it's Terry Pollard vibes on this. Oh wow. But, yeah. Okay. That it's got Jim, only, Jimmy uh, Cobb on drums as well. Right. Bit of a longer album as well. This, huh. yeah, this, yeah, cool another record. iconic cover. Can you tell us about this one? Fantastic on Argo. Weirdly, I mean, I think it was a chess, um, a chess label, wasn't it? So a bit, bit strange coming off of that that run of jazz record, jazz labels. Um, but yeah, killer record. A lot of covers on this one. Um, the band switches up again. We got John Tooley in there and Herman Wright. Um, yeah kind of her the start of her 60s run huh um and they all come in uh what do you uh these are the sleeves that everyone desires is this polyethylene poly Bla black black polyline sleeves they're called it just adds a bit more protection polyline you know the, the, these are the best sleeves yeah you see uh you see on all the quality pressings it's this fantastic harp next Again, yeah, her, her record on Atlantic, which would have signaled, I would have thought that perhaps she was going to kind of be an Atlantic artist. Um, great album. I, I think maybe the pick of the bunch and just, yeah, kind of signals where she was about to go. It really gives you a taste of that mid 60s and on on period. And the band, again, it's like, got you know, Willie Bobo's there on percussion, really kind of stretching out in terms of the type of musicians included really cool and fantastic art the art is phenomenal and you're yeah. right what's upcoming for new land what's next in the hopper and what would you really like to do that you haven't done yet oh so much um in terms of what's coming up we've just announced a charles mingus complete birdland recordings box set four lp set covering his shows at birdland from 61 to 62 Again, a long process of tracking down real tapes that were recorded from the original broadcast. We cleaned them, mastered them. Um, you know, it's one of those things where perhaps I think the, the hardcore audio files might be a bit, the sound isn't the absolute most, opt it's not Dorothy Ashby level, but historically this is incredibly important recordings and it does sound great. To me, it's like you're in the room when you listen to them. So very worthwhile picking up, I think. We put together a great book to go with it. We've got um, Christian McBride to write a forward. Brian Priestley, who's the kind of Mingus authority, wrote a 15,000 um, word essay on on the Birdland gigs and, and Mingus. Um, we got Charles McPherson interviewed for it, which was brilliant. And this is released in conjunction with the Mingus estate. So that's coming out at the end of October. That's available that's to pre-order Bird, now. Birdland, what year is it again? 1961 to 62. So is this like his band with Danny Richmond and who yeah, else? Yeah, exactly. Danny Richmond. We've got people like Yusuf Latif, Roland Kirk on there. Um, wow. It's just killer. Like a, it's, a, it's a rotating band, but you've got kind of the mainstays, of people like um, Danny Richmond throughout, Charles McPherson. Yeah. And um, when will that be released? That's October 27th. That's released worldwide. Thousand many, only. Is that more than one LP? Four LP box. Oh, it's record store day. No, 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 no. Okay. Just no, no. This is just a normal release. So, what are what are you hoping to do? We have well, I mean, in terms of what we actually have coming out, we've got a couple of Kenny Dorham titles coming out. Um, most likely one this year, one early next year. Um, again, those have been mastered directly from the original tapes. For, what are the Kevin titles Gray. of those, if you recall? Um, I'll give you the title for one, which is Jazz Contrasts, and that will be coming out later this year. And then we're also doing a John Wright Trio album, Nice and Tasty. Um, again, mastered directly from the original tapes um, by Kevin Gray, original art. Um, and actually on the, the Kenny Dorham title, we got Sonny Rollins to contribute some words to that. 
Wow. Um, amazingly so i got to i got to well i dealt with his manager but um wow. yeah the great sonny rollins so that's pretty amazing that's amazing yeah um so yeah that's the kind of immediate releases we have coming out um there's some there's quite a few things in the pipeline for next year but um can't really talk about those at the moment are there things you've wanted to do that you couldn't do for whatever reason oh yeah i mean countless <laughs> yeah the list Give never ends couple names um, I guess I want I, I, one record I'd love to do is an Alice Coltrane box in the style another hops, but in the style of the Dorothy Ashby. I think those records could really be put together, but I mean, it's very I, I, that's an imp, impulse on most of them, so it's quite difficult. Um, another Pharaoh Sanders, I think you know, tons to be done there. Um, hoping stuff comes out eventually. Um, loads beyond that, I guess you know. There's loads of one-off titles. There's all these labels like New Jazz, like, oh, sorry, Jazzland, like um, Prestige. I think there's tons of unreleased or unreissued titles within those those records beyond the kind of usual Coltrane's or whoever. There's a lot of you know, people like John Wright Trio. These are great records that have never been reprinted and probably a lot of people aren't aware of. Well, James, yeah. thank you for doing this so much. <clears throat> we actually did this the first time. And I was using the wrong account. It didn't record. So James is very gracious to redo this with me and act like I haven't asked this question to him before. But um, I, I hope we can do this again when your next Mingus box comes out. That'd be great. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, James. Cool. Thank you, Kim. Speak to you soon.